it's time for us to start thinking about something called predictive analytics. Now, in the world of predictive analytics, we're using a, a part of our data set to try and make some predictions about what's happening in, in a, another aspect of uh, the world that we don't have all the information about. So we're using uh, language about sort of a sample providing information about a population or something that happened in history being able to use to predict what's going to happen in the future. That's what we're talking about with predictive analytics and uh, this is a little bit of an introductory idea around a, a very important word in, in any analytical analysis called estimation. But before we do that, time for a different shirt. So today we have, as you might have, if you're familiar with flags, that's the uh, East Timor or uh, Timor Leste colours, and this is the T-shirt from the university, the main university, the University Nationale Timor Rosé, and uh, just time for a change of colour. Okay. Let's move across to the uh, presentation. So predictive analytics and particular estimation. So what I'm going to do is start you off with an example of something that we have actually seen in previous videos, if you've been watching all of them. And we've got some information about a bunch of individuals and with those individuals we are kind of particularly interested in some things about their behaviour and particularly how often they go to the doctor and how that might relate to their characteristics like their age, education levels, male or female uh, income and so on. So that's the kind of world we're in and um, we, can, we can take this set of data. This is a set of data on just over a thousand individuals that's been collected and they're not, clearly a thousand people means, it doesn't mean we're talking about every single person in the population. You know, the population of Australia is adults, so you know, the number of adults in Australia is over 10 million, so we've only got a thousand, but based on that thousand we, we, you know, we learn some things. In the tools around descriptive analytics, the word descriptive is all about describing what's actually going on with this particular set of data. In this case we discover some patterns and some relationships. So for example, if we were to take this set of data and just look at the number of doctor's visits, this column here, and we divide that up by gender. So we just look at the males and work at it, the average number of visits, and then we do that for females. The average number of visits for females is much higher than it is for males. 2.7 to about 1.9, so 0.8 bigger, so quite a lot bigger. On average, females visit the doctor 0.8 times more per quarter than males. That's quite a big difference. If we look at people in the low income category, 1800 a month versus those in the high income category, we see actually a little tiny difference. The people in high income categories go to the doctor a little bit more, 2.289 versus 2.272. Tiny difference, but it's there. How many people go, uh, don't know doctor's visits? What proportion of people never go to the doctor? Well, across the whole sample of all the data, it's 38%. But if we just look at people who were sampled during the winter, which is all the people who at a one in this column, and we could calculate the average number of doctors or percentage of people who never went to the doctor, and it's 37.9. All the other seasons, it's 38.1. So there's, there's practically no difference there between those two. But there is a there is a difference, but who knows whether it's a big one or not. Doctors' visits are the more educated, going to the doctor more or less. Well, the correlation there was minus 0.09, which is a number between zero and minus one or minus one and plus one, sorry. Um, and so that's moderately close to zero, but it's not as close to zero as this correlation here, which is the correlation between doctor's visits and income, where it's 0 0.005, so very close to zero. Okay, so we've learned some things. We've got some, some information there about various measures of interest. Um, and we're kind of interested in differences between these means or difference between these proportions or we're interested in knowing whether the correlations that we observe here are close to zero or not. Because if they're close to zero, that suggests there's no connection between doctors' visits and income. So small differences in the means and the proportions uh, tell, it suggests to us there's not much happening between those two groups. Correlations that are small suggest there's not much happening there either. So in fact, I guess this is a key idea we've got here. Those small differences you see, for example, between the number of visits that low-income people make versus high-income people, that's a tiny difference to the basically the second decimal place before you actually get any difference at all. 
that difference really is probably just no difference, practically no difference. If you basically saying that people's visits to the doctors does not depend on their income at all. It's just that when you get a particular set of data, you're never going to get exactly zero for the difference. They're not going to be identical to each other. So there'll be a little bit of um, difference just coming up in the data per se. But because it's so small, we, we have a pretty strong view that that difference is just fluke. It was pretty much zero. And uh, we've applied in that process of thinking through that some kind of judgment as to what is small. We're saying that difference in number of visits is very small. That difference, 1.8 to 2.6, is very big, or is, is not small. So that's a real difference. Men go to the doctor less than women. That's not just the kind of fluke of this particular set of data. That is a tiny difference, which probably really means there's no effect at all of income on visits to the doctor. So you have it coming to the different conclusions on the basis of some kind of view that this is basically a small and inconsequential difference that doesn't really count for anything, and this is not a small difference. What we need to do is identify the difference between real or substantive differences between, say, the means or substantive correlations, or whatever it might be, versus small things that are just coincidental, pretty much just chance. And that's important to us because the only ones we're really interested in are the real substantial differences. If there really is a consistent pattern that men go to the doctor less than women, then we have to address that with public policy to try and encourage men to go to the doctor more. Um, and if there really is a difference between the how the access that low-income people have to health services versus high-income people, if there really was a difference, then we should do something about that in policy. And Conversely, if we come to the conclusion that there is no real difference between low and high income, then we wouldn't be worried about um, the cost of health care because clearly it's not bar a barrier to people's access. So it's key that it's important that we identify the real and substantive differences between these means or proportions or the, the substantive correlations that are not just basically zero. Because that's how we predict what's going to happen in the future. So for us to, that's a very vague thing, but basically the key point here is we're trying to identify what we call real differences from chance differences. And the key to that is, is it small or is it not small? Now before we can do that, we've got to go into some concepts which we call statistical inference. And this is, so in other words, we're coming up now with a sort of theoretical framework for thinking about how you identify between small and big differences. So the theoretical framework, the sort of conceptual idea that we have, is that any time you have a set of data, it's actually not the whole data set. That example before is 1,221 individuals that the, that the people from the Department of Health surveyed. It's not the whole population of 12 million adults in Australia. So that's a sample. But we're going to use those 1,200 people to give us some idea about what's happening to the whole population. So we're using a sample quantity to estimate a population value. And that's the whole concept of statistical inference. And that's going to be, that, that idea is going to be the building block to being able to tell whether or not the result that we got was just tiny, inconsequential, or whether it was a real result. But let's just stare at this diagram and, and get what we're talking about here. These people here represent the whole population. Okay, So this is the whole group of people are interested in, all Australian adults, or all the people who have signed up for this subject or whatever. What we very often do, and what we do conceptually, and how we understand statistics, is we take a random selection of those people, and we get a sample. So in this case, we've got a big population of 20 or so people, and we've got a sample of just six. Obviously, the numbers are normally much, much bigger than that, but you get the idea. That's what we want to know about over this side. We want to know about the population. What we have to work with is just the sample. Remember when we talked in in the previous uh, time, if you're watching all this series, the very first video we talked about taking a sample as a means of learning something about a, a broader population. And we emphasise the importance of that sample being, sample being random because we, what you want is these six people here to be pretty typical of the whole lot. So you want it to be representative. And, and the way you achieve that is by randomness. Just a reminder of that point. Now, we don't want to know everything about the whole population. We just want to know about a certain set of characteristics of that population that might be interesting to us. You might want to know 
how many times do people in Australia go to the doctor on average? And then you might want to know a subset question to that. How many times do males in Australia go to the doctor on average? So both of those questions are asking questions about a characteristic of the population and in that case they're asking about the mean of the population, the mean of all people or the mean of all the males and then the mean of all the females to continue that thought. But that's what's known, that characteristic of the population, in this case the mean, is what's known as a parameter. So the parameter is some unknown characteristic of the population. It's unknown because that's what because we don't have the whole population of data. It's what we want to know about though. We want to know the average number of doctors visits of all Australians. What we have at our disposal to work with is this sample here. So what we do is we calculate a sample mean x bar and we call that a statistic because that's what we do. And we use that sample x bar to estimate the population mean u. And that process of estimation is what's called inference. We're inferring something from a sample mean about what we think the population mean might be. Okay, that's the basic concept of statistical inference in a nutshell. So we're using a sample statistic, a mean in that example I just gave, to estimate a population parameter. That's the first example that we've seen here. But we can use any number of other we could be interested in, in, in other characteristics of the population, apart from the mean. We might want to know about the proportion, the proportion of people who never go to the doctor. How will we get some idea about that? Well, we'll take a sample and we get the proportion of our sample that never went to the doctor. We might want to know about the difference between the mean for males and the mean for females. How will we answer that question? Well, we'll go to the data and we'll calculate the mean for males and the mean for females for our sample and use that to estimate the difference between males and females in the overall population. Perhaps we're interested in the difference in proportions. Is there a difference in the proportion of people who don't go to the doctor in the winter versus the spring? We'll answer that by looking at our sample of people from the winter and the spring and calculating the proportions who went to the doctor and looking at that difference. We want to know about the overall correlation between education and doctor's visits. We get our sample and we calculate the correlation for our particular sample of data and we use that to estimate the population parameter. So these statistics here are being used to estimate the population. Sorry, that doesn't work very well down the bottom of the screen again. I'll just run it up here. The population characteristics. Whenever you use this is, okay, so that's fine, that's pretty obvious, okay. If you want to know something about a whole population of data, get a sample, calculate the sample equivalent, and use it as an estimate. That's fine. If that's all that was involved, it would be sort of intuitively pretty obvious. But there's one extra step that we just need to, a very big step, that will actually make a big difference and take some time to, to explore all the implications of this. There's an implication of that, which is that any time you do that, you're probably not going to get the right answer you're using a sample statistic to estimate a population parameter, the estimate is, is only an estimate. It's only an approximation to the true value. So my sample mean will not be the population mean. It'll be an estimate of it. And estimates are, well, very rarely right. Might be a little bit too big, might be a little bit too small, hopefully not too far off, but it's only an estimate. So one way that you can really confirm that in your own head is to imagine you've got a population and you take a sample of data and you get an x-bar. And you go back to that population, you take another sample, well, you'd be extremely lucky if you got the same x-bar. Most likely you get a different x-bar. So you've got two x-bars now, well, one of them different to each other. They're both trying to estimate the same thing, mu. Clearly they can't both be right. One of them has to be right. Both of them are probably wrong and, and the right answer is, is some other number. Hopefully not too far off, but they, they can't possibly both be right. So one of the things that we need to be able to do is to find a way of capturing the idea of uncertainty in our estimates. And we use things like confidence intervals and hypothesis testing and standard errors to do that. This is a very important point and one thing that I think that sadly often people who make use of data in the public realm don't really get is that you know politicians are being the worst uh, 
at this is that they want an answer. Just tell me what's going to happen. If we do this, what will it be? And so the people who do the data analytics sort of feel obliged to give them an answer. Okay, well, if you do this um, intervention into the um, you know, in, into the environment sector and introduce these new policies, then it's going to reduce carbon emissions by this much, X percent, 10 percent, or something like that. And uh, so the government says, we're going to do all of these policies and we're going to reduce carbon emissions by 10 percent. Well, unfortunately, the data anal analyst who worked out that number knows very well that it was only based on a little bit of data, just on a sample. And they've used it best they can, applied their models and come up with an estimate. They know that that 10 percent is not going to be exactly what happens. It might be more than 10, it might be less than 10. So they would much rather tell the, pub the government uh, or the politician Look, we think it's going to be, you know, somewhere around 10 percent, maybe more, maybe as as bad as 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 big an increase as 15 percent, maybe only 5 percent uh, reduction, but somewhere between 5 and 15 might be what they'd like to say. What they'd be saying in that case is what we call a confidence interval. We're pretty sure that the effect of these policies are going to be to reduce carbon emissions by somewhere between 5 and 15 percent. We don't know for sure, but somewhere in that range. Well, unfortunately, whilst that's uh, desirable and that's really what we can say, unfortunately politicians often don't like that. They just want one number. Just tell me, what is it going to be? So you say, well, 10%. So we kind of forced into uh, explaining our results in a way that we actually don't believe in because what we know very much to be true is that any time we estimate something, there's going to be likelihoods of error and we would rather say and acknowledge that possible error in the way we report our results. But before we can get into that, we actually need to understand how we characterise and measure the magnitude of our accuracy. That's that would be really desirable. So that when we, if we get permission to say it, we can say to politicians, we think it's going to be 10%, but it could be as high as 15% reduction, and it could be as low as 5%, for example. That's a way of communicating our uncertainty. Well, how do we get to that point? Uh, that, that requires us to understand concepts of confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, and so on. And, and if you watch some more of the videos, you'll learn some of, that, some of those things over time. Well, I believe that's everything I want to say to you today, so I shall um, say farewell. Thanks for listening.